Hi, and welcome to another riveting edition of According to Pete, where today we answer the question, what in the bejesus would I ever do with a transistor? Now this is a very huge subject, in my opinion. Not just because they're complicated, but there's, there's a lot of surrounding bits uh, of information that you need to know uh, in order to use them properly. And we're not going to be able to cover everything, obviously, but I'm going to try to give you enough information to get in trouble, but not so much that you're bored. So we're going to jump right in. Now, before we talk about transistors, we got to talk about diodes because they're very closely related. All right? That is a diode. Now, diodes are interesting for a couple of different reasons. One being that they only conduct current in one direction, which is to say, like this. Now they're also interesting because when they're conducting, they only drop a certain amount of voltage, right? When this thing is totally on, it'll drop about 0.6 volts. Um, now this is a garden variety uh, silicon diode, like uh, a 1N4148 or something like that. Uh, now let me take a little stab at explaining how that actually works. This diode is actually made up of two different kinds of material. Pow! Blam! Now this corresponds to this, and this is called the anode, okay? It is made up of silicon, which is treated with impurities. We'll call it the P material for the time being. The bottom is treated with another impurity, and I can't remember what the impurities are off the top of my head, but we'll call this the N material. Now the way these things work is that after being, it's, it's silicon, right? So after it's being treated with the impurity, the N material has an excess of electrons, okay? It's got electrons it can just shed. The P material has an excess of holes, all right? Which is kind of a funny way of saying uh, if the P material were a city bus, there's an empty seat on the bus for the electron to hang out in. So when you get these two materials together, something kind of interesting happens. A depletion region forms where the carriers actually separate. And electricity will not conduct here. Now if you apply a voltage from anode to cathode, the depletion region will actually shrink and then you'll get current conducting. Okay. Now if you swap this and you make this side, the, the anode um, po uh, negative and the cathode positive, the depletion region actually gets bigger and um, you don't get current going in either direction. And ultimately, um, if you reverse this enough, it'll go bang. So now, when this thing is conducting, and this is important to show, this is voltage, and this is current at about 0 0.6 volts. Up until that voltage, the diode will not conduct very much. And then at about there, it does this. Wow! And it goes straight up, right? So what you can see from this is that applying more voltage to the diode really only makes it conduct gobs and gobs of current. This is why you never put a diode uh, across a voltage source because it'll do this and then it'll go pop. There's a lot of different kinds of diodes out there um, and they have a lot of different specs regarding their operation. Uh, the ones that you're going to be interested in most probably when shopping for diodes are going to be uh, forward voltage drop, like they're not all like this, they're not all 0.6 volts. Um, forward bias current, like max current, you're going to want to know that, where something's going to fry. Uh, and also reverse bias voltage breakdown. You're going to want to know how much voltage you can put across this thing backwards before it's going to pop. Now there are two special cases, right? This was the garden variety 1N4148. Uh, there are two special cases of diodes that I'd like to draw your attention to real quick. All right, the first example is what's called a Zener diode. Looks something like yay. You'll notice from the last one that I drew, the 4148, this one I've got turned backwards, okay? There's a reason for that. Let me show you what the curve looks like in this thing. So up here, you've got the regular diode thing where it goes and goes up. And back here, wham, it does this. Blam! This is where the Zener diode operates normally, under normal conditions, right? And you can buy Zener diodes so that this voltage here, I didn't indicate that, this is voltage, this is current, this voltage can be very, very specific, okay? Um, and you can buy a range of them. Normally, where you would use a Zener diode is like in a voltage reference, um, because they're pretty stable once they get to the breakdown region. Uh, you might also see it in a really, really bad design as a voltage regulator, but don't ever do that. That's bad. Bad, bad, bad. 
Okay, so the only other example, the only other thing I really want to draw your attention to, besides what I've already done, is this guy. <laughs> it's an LED, right? Everybody knows what these things are. The reason it's cool, of course, is because it makes light when it's conducting, right? Now, an LED will typically have uh, a greater voltage drop than your garden variety silicon diode. In fact, I think uh, they can go anywhere from one and a half to like three and a half volts uh, are the ones that I usually see. Um, and they usually work at lower currents, like the smaller LEDs uh, will usually be, they'll max out at like 30, 40, 50 milliamps maybe. But of course there are high power LEDs uh, that run much higher. The brightness corresponds to how much current is actually running through the thing. You normally set these up with like a limiting resistor, right? Because that's what you want to use to set your current. So before we talked about transistors, we had to talk about diodes because they're very closely related. So let's draw a transistor. The symbol for a transistor looks like this. Okay? And leads coming off. This is an NPN BJT, which is bipolar junction transistor. Okay? Now it's got three leads instead of two. This one is called the Colector. This one is called the E. Mit and this one is called the base. Now a transistor, um, where a diode is made up of two regions of N and P material, the transistor is made up of three regions. In this case, it's an NPN. All right. Now what this basically looks like, and this is going to get tight here, is sort of like this. That's the base, that's the collector, and that's the emitter. Basically how this thing works is like an electron valve, okay? You can turn it on, you can turn it off. Now, like I said back here, NPN, right? The emitter to base is actually a diode, okay? So if you forward bias this junction, which is to say I put minus there and I put plus here, um, and you get a little current going through that way, you can actually get a really big current going through from the emitter to the collector. How much bigger? Well, if you check the data sheet for, um, for example, the garden variety 2N3904, um, you will find a little parameter called HFE, uh, or you might find it referred to as beta, um, or they might make a little script, lowercase b. Um, but this is the gain factor for current of a transistor. And for this part, it's usually in the neighborhood of 100 to 200. Now for other parts which are not the 2N3904, like a high power part, um, this number is actually much, much lower. Uh, it can be in the range of like 20 to 30 in some cases. Uh, and it just has to do with uh, the, the physical construction of the part and such. Um, but for this part, 100 to 200 is pretty common. So at this point, let me clarify something. If I set up my 2N3904 with a base current of, say, 10 milliamps, and I've got a beta uh, of, of 200, I'm not automatically going to get 2 amps worth of electrons shooting out of the collector into whatever I happen to attach to it. Think of the collector emitter pair to be more like a variable resistor. When I have a lot of current going through the base, the resistance of the emitter to collector is going to be real small. If I have no current going through the uh, base to emitter, then the resistance from emitter to collector is going to be very large. Let's say, for example, that you want to drive a high power LED from your microcontroller, okay? But your microcontroller pin only can source about, say, 30 milliamps. Uh, but your LED that you want to power um, will run happily at 100 milliamps. How do we set this up? If I just wanted to drive the LED from this source and, and I didn't want to turn it on and off, um, these two numbers being in very close proximity to each other should be your first red flag that we're going to have to be tricky, all right? Because 3.3 volts minus 3 volts is 0.3 volts. That's all you've got to work with to set up your limiting resistor to make sure that you're running at 100 milliamps, right? So what is that? Well, you've got 
zero point three volts divided by one hundred milliamp equals three freaking ohms. I don't have any of those lying around. Okay, and pretty precise. You know, I, you can get one percent resistors, but there's there's going to be enough variance in that current trying to shoot for that. So we got to do something else. Instead of going to 3.3 volts, we're going to go to our supply voltage that feeds our 3.3 volt regulator. In this case, we're going to say it's six volts. Here's our microcontroller, and remember, this is being fed with 3.3 volts. Here's our pin that we're going to drive with and we're going to have a limiting resistor and this is going to be attached to the base of our transistor the emitter is going to go to ground and the collector we don't know what the collector is going to yet it's a secret now remember the the base to emitter junction is a diode right it's only going to drop 0 0.6 volts from here to here okay so now, really, when this thing is on and you put a meter here, obviously that's ground, to here, um, you're going to read 0.6 volts. If you don't use this limiting resistor, you will destroy this part. And also remember that when this pin is on, it's going to be at 3.3 volts there. So that resistor is going to drop 3.3 minus 0.6, 2.7 volts. Now, how much do we want to turn this thing on? Um, now remember, the base to emitter current is much smaller than emitter to collector by a factor of beta. We're going to pick a number. Say I want to drive this thing at 5 milliamps, okay? I need to calculate the, the value of that resistor. So what's that value going to be? Well, it's going to be 3.3 volts minus 0.6 volts divided by 5 milliamps. And what's that, you say? It's 540 ohms. Now, I probably won't have one of those lying around. I think that's a standard value if I remember correctly. Um, but more likely, I'm going to have a 330 ohm. I got dozens of these. I also got 470s I could use, but I probably have more of these. So I'll slide a 330 ohm in here, and this current will actually be more than 5 milliamps, but that's okay because it's not enough to destroy this part and it will really only turn the part on more. So allow more current through, okay? So we're gonna call this 330 ohms instead of 540. Now that we got this thing turned on a lot, we can do what's gonna happen up here, okay? You're gonna have current going, yay! So up here, I'm gonna have my high power diode, my high power LED. Now if you look at the data sheet for uh, the 2N3904, you will see a specification called VCE SAT. Okay? What this is, is a voltage that you will see from collector to emitter when this thing is saturated, which is to say when it's really, really on. Okay? Now, the value at, uh, at what we're operating at, if you check the data sheet, is about. 0 0.3 volts, okay? What that means is that when this thing is totally on, I can expect this point here to be 0 0.3 volts above ground. Don't let the physical appearance of this symbol confuse you. Don't say, oh, it's got to be higher because it's higher than this one. No, not true. Um, this will be at 0.3 volts or thereabouts, okay? Now, if we've got 6 volts, up here, ultimately, you got 0.3 volts here, and you've got 3 volts across this LED, because we said right there that it was going to be 3 volts. Um, you've basically got 3.3 volts <laughs> at this point, and then you've got 2.7 volts that you have to find a home for. What are you going to do? You can't take this thing all the way up to 6 volts, because it'll draw all the current in your house. So what do you do? you put in a limiting resistor, like yay. What's the value of that guy up there? Well, let's see. 2.7 volts divided by um, 0 0.1 amp, right? Because that's 100 milliamps, equals 
27 ohms. Now that's even a standard value. And a 1% variance in that guy isn't going to make as much impact as my last example, where a 1% variance in a 3 ohm resistor, that would have some impact. Now, this is not the only calculation you have to do. You also have to figure out how much power that thing is going to drop, okay? Ohm's law. We talked about this. This is important. The reason is because if you take 2.7 volts and multiply it times 0.1 amp, you get 270 milliwatts. That is not a W. That's more than a quarter watt, which is a standard through-hole resistor, right? So this resistor, while it's going to have to be 27 ohms, it's also going to have to be half watt. If you don't make it a half watt, it's going to smoke. Now, one thing you might be thinking at this point, since I just put that guy up there, and you heard me earlier say that you can think of this thing as a variable resistor. Well, shouldn't you then be able to set up your base emitter current to bias this thing such that it limits effectively there? Wrong. No, you can't ever do that. Do not. Um, the reason is because beta, the gain factor, will vary from part to part. I mean, one 3904 next to another one will be a different beta, okay? Um, and that the factor changes based on your bias conditions. So you can't depend on the number. It'll be all over the road. So anytime you ever set up a circuit with uh, a transistor, you always want to make it beta independent, okay? That's why I turned this thing all the way on, and that's why I got that. This is going to work reliably. The other way, where I try to balance this, not going to work. So I'm going to stop there uh, with regard to my description of transistors. To give you an idea of where we are on the active component food chain, uh, there's also PNP transistors, where the first one was NPN, these other ones are PNP, and they work sort of opposite the way that an NPN will work. These BJT transistors can be used for amplification, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can set up a bias with those. Shortcomings of BJTs can be stuff like switching speed, parasitics, input and output impedances that you have to account for. They tend to be inefficient with power applications, and so you might go to something like a MOSFET. And when you play with MOSFETs for a while, you know, sometimes the shortcomings of those will not work for you. Either. So then you go to an op amp, right? Now I'll be honest with you, I don't use BJTs for anything besides like, like my example, switching out an LED, right? I don't use them for amplification because there's op amps and op amps are uh, readily available, relatively cheap, and they're really simple to use. But before we can talk about op amps and MOSFETs, we got to cover transistors, and that's what we did today. If you want more information, you can check out Wikipedia. If you want me to address some more of the biasing questions regarding transistors, you can ask and we can go into it, but it gets complicated and it gets complicated quickly. The last thing I want to talk about real quick is uh, my project that I mentioned last time. I built my workbench in my garage and now I need to put a shelf above it so I can mount all my junk to it and have a place for my speakers. I really wanted to start getting into uh, the amplifier kit to explain why I like this kit, but I'm going to have to attack that next time. Thanks for watching. Uh, you can send your questions to feedback at sparkfun.com in the subject line according to Pete. Uh, I will get the question and put it in the queue and, and there it will be. And until next time, see ya.